Crime and Punishment, Part 2, Chapter 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Constance Garnett Part 2, Chapter 2 And what if there has been a search already? What if I find them in my room? But here was his room. Nothing and no one in it. No one had peeped in. Even Natasya had not touched it. By heavens, how could he have left all those things in the hole? He rushed to the corner, slipped his hand under the paper, pulled the things out, and lined his pockets with them. There were eight articles in all, two little boxes with earrings or something of the sort, he hardly looked to see, then four small leather cases. There was a chain, too, merely wrapped in newspaper, and something else in newspaper that looked like a decoration. He put them all in the different pockets of his overcoat, and the remaining pocket of his trousers, trying to conceal them as much as possible. He took the purse, too. Then he went out of his room, leaving the door open. He walked quickly and resolutely, and though he felt shattered, he had his senses about him. He was afraid of pursuit. He was afraid that, in another half hour, another quarter of an hour, perhaps, instructions would be issued for his pursuit. And so, at all costs, he must hide all traces before then. He must clear everything up while he still had some strength, some reasoning power left him. Where was he to go? That had long been settled. Fling them into the canal, and all traces hidden in the water, the thing would be at an end. So he had decided in the night of his delirium, when several times he had had the impulse to get up and go away, to make haste and get rid of it all. But to get rid of it turned out to be a very difficult task. He was wandering along the bank of the Ekaterininsky Canal for half an hour or more, and looked several times at the steps running down to the water, but he could not think of carrying out his plan. Either rafts stood at the steps' edge, and women were washing clothes on them, or boats were moored there, and people were swarming everywhere. Moreover, he could be seen and noticed from the banks on all sides. It would look suspicious for a man to go down on purpose, stop, and throw something into the water. And what if the boxes were to float instead of sinking? And of course they would. Even as it was, everyone he met seemed to stare and look round, as if they had nothing to do but watch him. Why is it, or can it be my fancy? he thought. At last the thought struck him that it might be better to go to the Neva. There were not so many people there. He would be less observed, and it would be more convenient in every way. Above all, it was further off. He wondered how he could have been wandering for a good half hour, worried and anxious in this dangerous past without thinking of it before. And that half hour he had lost over an irrational plan, simply because he had thought of it in delirium. He had become extremely absent and forgetful, and he was aware of it. He certainly must make haste. He struck out towards the Neva, along V Prospect, but on the way another idea struck him. Why the Neva? Would it not be better to go somewhere far off, to the islands again, and there hide the things in some solitary place, in a wood, or under a bush, and mark the spot, perhaps? And though he felt incapable of clear judgment, the idea seemed to him a sound one. But he was not determined to go there, for coming out of V Prospect toward the square, he saw on the left a passage leading between two blank walls to a courtyard. On the right hand, the blank, unwhitewashed wall of a four-storied house stretched far into the court. On the left, a wooden hoarding ran parallel with it for twenty paces into the court, and then turned sharply to the left. Here was a deserted, fenced-off place where rubbish of different sorts was lying. At the end of the court, 
the corner of a low, smutty, stone shed, apparently part of some workshop, peeped from behind the hoarding. It was probably a carriage builder's or carpenter's shed. The whole place from the entrance was black with coal dust. Here would be a place to throw it, he thought. Not seeing anyone in the yard, he slipped in, and at once saw near the gate a sink, such as is often put in yards where there are many workmen or cab drivers, and on the hoarding above had been scribbled in chalk the time-honored witticism, standing here strictly forbidden. This was all the better, for there would be nothing suspicious about his going in. Here I could throw it all in a heap and get away, looking round once more, with his hand already in his pocket, he noticed against the outer wall, between the entrance and the sink, a big, unhewn stone, weighing perhaps sixty pounds. The other side of the wall was a street. He could hear passers-by, always numerous in that part, but he could not be seen from the entrance unless someone came in from the street, which might well happen indeed, so there was need of haste. He bent down over the stone, seized the top of it firmly in both hands, and using all his strength, turned it over. Under the stone was a small hollow in the ground, and immediately he emptied his pocket into it. The purse lay at the top, and yet the hollow was not filled up. Then he seized the stone again, and with one twist turned it back, so that it was in the same position again though it stood a very little higher. But he scraped the earth about it and pressed it at the edges with his foot. Nothing could be noticed. Then he went out and turned into the square. Again, an intense, almost unbearable joy overwhelmed him for an instant, as it had in the police office. I have buried my tracks, and who, who can think of looking under that stone? It has been lying there most likely ever since the house was built, and will lie as many years more. And if it were found, who would think of me? It is all over, no clue. And he laughed. Yes, he remembered that he began laughing a thin, nervous, noiseless laugh, and went on laughing all the time he was crossing the square. But when he reached the K Boulevard, where two days before he had come upon that girl, his laughter suddenly ceased. Other ideas crept into his mind. He felt all at once that it would be loathsome to pass that seat on which, after the girl was gone, he had sat and pondered, and that it would be hateful, too, to meet that whiskered policeman to whom he had given twenty kopecks. Damn him! He walked, looking about him angrily and distractedly. All his ideas now seemed to be circling round some single point, and he felt that there really was such a point, and that now, now, he was left facing that point, and for the first time, indeed, during the last two months. Damn it all, he thought suddenly, in a fit of ungovernable fury. If it has begun, then it has begun. Hang the new life! Good Lord, how stupid it is! And what lies I told today! How despicably I fawned upon that wretched Ilya Petrovitch! And that is all folly! What do I care for them all, and my fawning upon them? It is not that at all! It is not that at all! Suddenly he stopped. A new, utterly unexpected, and exceedingly simple question perplexed, and bitterly confounded him. If it all has really been done deliberately, and not idiotically, if I really had a certain and definite object, how is it I did not even glance into the purse, and don't know what I had there, for which I have undergone these agonies, and have deliberately undertaken this base, filthy, degrading business? And here... I wanted at once to throw into the water the purse together with all the things which I had not seen either. How was that? Yes, that was so. That was all so. Yet he had known it all before, and it was not a new question for him. 
even when it was decided in the night without hesitation and consideration, as though so it must be, as though it could not possibly be otherwise. Yes, he had known it all, and understood it all. It surely had all been settled, even yesterday, at the moment when he was bending over the box and pulling the jewel cases out of it. Yes, so it was. It is because I am very ill, he decided grimly at last. I have been worrying and fretting myself, and I don't know what I am doing. Yesterday, and the day before yesterday, and all this time, I have been worrying myself. I shall get well, and I shall not worry. But what if I don't get well at all? Good God, how sick I am of it all! He walked on without resting. He had a terrible longing for some distraction, but he did not know what to do, what to attempt. A new, overwhelming sensation was gaining more and more mastery over him every moment. This was an immeasurable, almost physical repulsion for everything surrounding him, an obstinate, malignant feeling of hatred. All who met him were loathsome to him. He loathed their faces, their movements, their gestures. If anyone had addressed him, he felt that he might have spat at him or bitten him. He stopped suddenly on coming out on the bank of the Little Neva, near the bridge to Vasilyevsky Ostrov. Why, he lives here, in that house, he thought. Why, I have not come to Razumihin of my own accord. Here it's the same thing over again. Very interesting to know, though. Have I come on purpose, or have I simply walked here by chance? Never mind. I said the day before yesterday that I would go and see him the day after. Well, and so I will. Besides, I really cannot go further now. He went up to Razumihin's room on the fifth floor. The latter was at home in his garret, busily writing at the moment, and he opened the door himself. It was four months since they had seen each other. Razumikhin was sitting in a ragged dressing-gown with slippers on his bare feet, unkempt, unshaven, and unwashed. His face showed surprise. "'Is it you?' he cried. He looked his comrade up and down. Then, after a brief pause, he whistled. As hard up as all that. Why, brother, you've cut me out, he added, looking at Raskolnikov's rags. Come, sit down. You are tired, I'll be bound. And when he had sunk down on the American leather sofa, which was in even worse condition than his own, Razumikhin saw at once that his visitor was ill. Why, you are seriously ill. Do you know that? He began feeling his pulse. Raskolnikov pulled away his hand. Never mind, he said. I have come for this. I have no lessons. I wanted... But I don't really want lessons. But I say, you are delirious, you know, Razumikhin observed, watching him carefully. No, I am not. Raskolnikov got up from the sofa. As he mounted the stairs to Razumikhin's, he had not realized that he would be meeting his friend face to face. Now, in a flash, he knew that what he was least of all disposed for at the moment was to be face to face with anyone in the wide world. His spleen rose within him. He almost choked with rage at himself as soon as he crossed Razumikhin's threshold. "'Good-bye,' he said abruptly and walked to the door. "'Stop! Stop! You queer fish!' "'I don't want to,' said the other, again pulling away his hand. "'Then why the devil have you come? Are you mad or what? Why, this is almost insulting. I won't let you go like that.' "'Well, then, I came to you because I know no one but you who could help. To begin, because you are kinder than anyone, cleverer, I mean, and can judge—' And now I see that I want nothing. Do you hear? Nothing at all. No one's services, 
no one's sympathy. I am by myself, alone. Come, that's enough. Leave me alone. Stay a minute, you sweep. You are a perfect madman. As you like, for all I care, I have no lessons, do you see, and I don't care about that. But there's a bestseller, Haruvimov, and he takes the place of a lesson. I would not exchange him for five lessons. He's doing publishing of a kind, and issuing natural science manuals, and, and what a circulation they have. The very titles are worth the money. You always maintained that I was a fool, but by Jove, my boy, there are greater fools than I am. Now he is setting up for being advanced, not that he has an inkling of anything, but of course I encourage him. Here are two signatures of the German text. In my opinion, the crudest charlatanism. It discusses the question, is woman a human being? And of course triumphantly proves that she is. Haruvimov is going to bring out this work as a contribution to the woman question. I am translating it. He will expand these two and a half signatures into six. We shall make up a gorgeous title half a page long and bring it out at half a ruble. It will do. He pays me six rubles the signature. It works out to about fifteen rubles for the job. And I've had six already in advance. When we have finished this, we are going to begin translation about whales. And then some of the dullest scandals out of the second part of Les Confessions we have marked for translation. Somebody has told Haruvimov that Rousseau was a kind of radish chef. You may be sure I don't contradict him, hang him. Well, would you like to do the second signature of Is Woman a Human Being? If you would, take the German and pens and paper. All those are provided, and take three rubles. For, as I have had six rubles in advance on the whole thing, three rubles comes to you for your share. And when you have finished the signature, there will be another three rubles for you. And please don't think I am doing you a service. Quite the contrary, as soon as you came in, I saw how you could help me. To begin with, I am weak in spelling, and secondly, I am sometimes utterly adrift in German, so that I make it up as I go along for the most part. The only comfort is that it's bound to be a change for the better. Though who can tell? Maybe it's sometimes for the worse. Will you take it? Raskolnikov took the German sheets in silence, took the three rubles, and without a word went out. Razumikhin gazed after him in astonishment. But when Raskolnikov was in the next street, he turned back, mounted the stairs to Razumikhin's again, and laying on the table the German article and the three rubles, went out again, still without uttering a word. "'Are you raving or what?' Razumikhin shouted, roused to fury at last. "'What farce is this? You're driving me crazy, too. What did you come to see me for, damn you?' "'I don't want translation,' muttered Raskolnikov from the stairs. "'Then what the devil do you want?' shouted Razumikhin from above. Raskolnikov continued descending the staircase in silence. "'Hey! Hey there! Where are you living?' No answer. Well, confound you, then. But Raskolnikov was already stepping into the street. On the Nikolevsky bridge he was aroused to full consciousness again by an unpleasant incident. A coachman, after shouting at him two or three times, gave him a violent lash on the back with his whip, for having almost fallen under his horse's hooves. The lash so infuriated him that he dashed away to the railing, for some unknown reason he had been walking in the very middle of the bridge in the traffic. He angrily clinched and ground his teeth. He heard laughter, of course. Serves him right. A pickpocket, I dare say. Pretending to be drunk, for sure, and getting under the wheels on purpose. And you have to answer for him. It's the regular profession, that's what it is. But while he stood at the railing, still looking angry and bewildered after the retreating carriage and rubbing his back, he suddenly felt someone thrust money into his hand. He looked. It was an elderly woman in a kerchief and goatskin shoes, with a girl, probably her daughter, wearing a hat and carrying a green parasol. "'Take it, my good man, in Christ's name!' He took it, and they passed on. It was a piece of twenty kopecks. From his dress and appearance, they might well have taken him for a beggar asking alms in the street, 
and the gift of twenty kopecks he doubtless owed to the blow, which made them feel sorry for him. He closed his hand on the twenty kopecks, and walked on for ten paces, and turned facing the Neva, looking toward the palace. The sky was without a cloud, and the water was almost bright blue, which is so rare in the Neva. The cupola of the cathedral, which is seen at its best from the bridge about twenty paces from the chapel, glittered in the sunlight, and in the pure air every ornament on it could be clearly distinguished. The pain from the lash went off, and Raskolnikov forgot about it. One uneasy and not quite definite idea occupied him now completely. He stood still, and gazed long and intently into the distance. This spot was especially familiar to him. When he was attending the university, he had hundreds of times, generally on his way home, stood still on this spot, gazed at this truly magnificent spectacle, and almost always marveled at a vague and mysterious emotion it roused in him. It left him strangely cold. This gorgeous picture was for him blank and lifeless. He wondered every time at his somber and enigmatic impression, and mistrusting himself, put off finding the explanation of it. He vividly recalled those old doubts and perplexities, and it seemed to him that it was no mere chance that he recalled them now. It struck him as strange and grotesque that he should have stopped at the same spot as before, as though he actually imagined he could think the same thoughts, be interested in the same theories and pictures that had interested him so short a time ago. He felt it almost amusing, and yet it wrung his heart. Deep down, hidden far away, out of sight, all that seemed to him now. All his old past, his old thoughts, his old problems and theories, his old impressions, and that picture, and himself, and all, all. He felt as though he were flying upwards, and everything were vanishing from his sight. Making an unconscious movement with his hand, he suddenly became aware of the piece of money in his fist. He opened his hand, stared at the coin, and with a sweep of his arm flung it into the water. Then he turned and went home. It seemed to him he had cut himself off from everyone and from everything at that moment. Evening was coming on when he reached home, so that he must have been walking about six hours. How and where he came back he did not remember. Undressing and quivering like an overdriven horse, he lay down on the sofa, drew his great coat about him, and at once sank into oblivion. It was dusk when he was waked up by a fearful scream. Good God, what a scream! Such unnatural sounds, such howling, wailing, grinding, tears, blows, and curses he had never heard. He could never have imagined such brutality, such frenzy. In terror, he sat up in bed, almost swooning with agony. But the fighting, wailing, and cursing grew louder and louder, and then, to his intense amazement, he caught the voice of his landlady. She was howling, shrieking, and wailing, rapidly, hurriedly, incoherently, so that he could not make out what she was talking about. She was beseeching, no doubt, not to be beaten, for she was being mercilessly beaten on the stairs. The voice of her assailant was so horrible from spite and rage that it was almost a croak. But he, too, was saying something, and just as quickly and indistinctly, hurrying and spluttering. All at once Raskolnikov trembled. He recognized the voice. It was the voice of Ilya Petrovitch. Ilya Petrovitch here and beating the landlady? He is kicking her, banging her head against the steps. That's clear. That can be told from the sounds, from the cries and the thuds. How is it? Is the world topsy-turvy? He could hear people running in crowds from all the stories and all the staircases. He heard voices, exclamations, knocking, doors banging. But why? Why? How could it be? He repeated, thinking seriously that he had gone mad. But no, he heard too distinctly. And they would come to him then next. For no doubt it's all about that, about yesterday, good God. He would have fastened his door with the latch, but he could not lift his hand. 
Besides, it would be useless. Terror gripped his heart like ice, tortured him and numbed him. But at last all this uproar, after continuing about ten minutes, began gradually to subside. The landlady was moaning and groaning. Ilya Petrovitch was still uttering threats and curses. But at last he, too, seemed to be silent, and now he could not be heard. "'Can he have gone away? Good Lord!' "'Yes, and now the landlady is going, too, still weeping and moaning. And then her door slammed. Now the crowd was going from the stairs to the rooms, exclaiming, disputing, calling to one another, raising their voices to a shout, dropping them to a whisper. There must have been numbers of them. Almost all the inmates of the block. But, good God, how could this be? And why? Why had he come here? Raskolnikov sank worn out on the sofa, but could not close his eyes. He lay for half an hour in such anguish, such an intolerable sensation of infinite terror as he had never experienced before. Suddenly a bright light flashed into his room. Nastasia came in with a candle and a plate of soup. Looking at him carefully, and ascertaining he was not asleep, she set the candle on the table and began to lay out what she had brought, bread, salt, a plate, a spoon. "'You've eaten nothing since yesterday, I warrant. You've been trudging about all day, and you're shaking with fever. "'Nastasia, what were they beating the landlady for?' She looked intently at him. "'Who beat the landlady?' "'Just now, half an hour ago. "'Ilya Petrovitch, the assistant superintendent, on the stairs. "'Why was he ill-treating her like that, and why was he here?' Nastasia scrutinized him, silent and frowning, and her scrutiny lasted a long time. He felt uneasy, even frightened at her searching eyes. "'Nastasia, why don't you speak?' "'Nastasia, why don't you speak?' he said timidly at last in a weak voice. "'It's the blood,' she answered at last, softly, as though speaking to herself. "'Blood? What blood?' he muttered, growing white and turning towards the wall. Nastasia still looked at him without speaking. "'Nobody has been beating the landlady,' she declared at last in a firm, resolute voice. He gazed at her, hardly able to breathe. "'I heard it myself. I was not asleep. I was sitting up,' he said more timidly. "'I listened a long time. The assistant superintendent came. Everyone ran out on the stairs from all the flats. "'No one has been here. That's the blood crying in your ears. When there's no outlet for it and it gets clotted, you begin fancying things.' "'Will you eat something?' He made no answer. Nastasia stood over him, watching him. "'Give me something to drink, Nastasia.' She went downstairs and returned with a white earthenware jug of water. He remembered only swallowing one sip of cold water and spilling some on his neck. Then followed forgetfulness. End Part 2 Chapter 2